drifting in electronically. Um, but we're really excited for tonight's program on the Snakes of Arizona. Uh, my name is Tom Fleischner. I'm the executive director of the Natural History Institute based here, uh, which is a sort of mission-based uh, independent nonprofit in, based in Prescott, Arizona, here in the Mogollon Highlands ecoregion. Uh, and our uh, mission uh, is to provide leadership and resources for a revitalized practice of natural history that integrates art, science, and humanities to promote the health and well-being of humans and the rest of the natural world. So that's a big, a big task, and we, we do try to integrate art, science, and humanities as our approaches uh, to understanding and falling in love with the world. And really, uh, if you were to boil it down, our mission is to foster love and understanding of the world that we live in. A uh, couple things I wanted to say just as far as resources, if you have, if, if you're new to the Institute, welcome to our community and uh, direct you uh, to our website, which has all sorts of great resources on it. That's just naturalhistoryinstitute.org. Uh, and we also have a YouTube channel, which can be linked uh, just through YouTube or uh, through our website. And um, we have an archive of all sorts of wonderful programs that we've had, including as of tomorrow, this program will be there as well. So if you want to uh, uh, share this program with other folks after the fact, you can direct them to that. Um, and uh, as an independent nonprofit, we were, of course, uh, always um, were scraping by and, and uh, would ask you to consider supporting our work. Um, also want to give a shout out to our co-sponsor tonight which is the wonderful independent bookstore right around the corner from our office called the Peregrine Book Company here in Prescott. Um, they are a great partner uh, with us, uh, really promote natural history um, in many wonderful ways. And they, uh, this book is available from Peregrine and their uh, website is simply peregrinebookcompany.com. And if you're interested, their phone also, you can get it through that website, but it's 928 Four four five nine thousand. That's nine two eight four four five nine thousand. So thank you again to Peregrine. Also want to give a shout out to my colleague Bob Ellis, who you see his name there on the screen, but he's the program director of the institute and he's handling a lot of the tech concerns behind the scenes here tonight. Uh, just a couple things on sort of the Zoom protocols here tonight, how this will work. Some of you probably spend endless hours on Zoom and some might be more new to it. Um, as I mentioned, the, the chat function is, is on right now if you wanna say hello or whatnot, but we will be turning that off as soon as I turn this over to Andy to, to begin the, the presentation, just because we found that it's distracting. Uh, and instead, we will have the Q, you'd be using the Q&A function. And if you, uh, for, again, for those of you who are new to Zoom, if on the lower, the sort of toolbar at the bottom of the screen towards the right-hand side, there's a little icon with a Q&A. And that's how you can um, uh, put questions, which we'll get to a little bit later. And you can start doing that at any time through the presentation is adding questions on there. If Andy says something that brings a question to mind. Also, on, once you get in that Q&A thing, there is a, a thumbs up uh, function so that if somebody else has already written a question, that's what you said, just add the thumbs up instead of writing a whole nother question. And then we can kind of see where there's special interest. Um, I'll mention a little bit about that. Again, as I already mentioned, um, there is, uh, there will be, um, uh, that this program will be uh, archived on our YouTube channel about this time, by this time tomorrow. So um, it's, uh, uh, my great pleasure to introduce our, our guest of honor tonight, Dr. Andy Holy Cross. Um, welcome, Andy. Thanks so much for being with us tonight. Um, just a couple inter uh, couple things on Andy. Um, Andy has both bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Nebraska and then came to Arizona uh, about 20 or so years ago and got a PhD in zoology from Arizona State University. And in that, his dissertation uh, research was on rattlesnakes in the Sky Islands. Um, uh, Andy also, this doesn't show up on resumes, but Andy is a very accomplished and intrepid Grand Canyon explorer. In fact, just came back from an exciting trip down roaming around in the canyon. 
Um, he is a professor of biology at Mesa Community College, also adjunct faculty at ASU, and I'm very happy to say that Andy is also a research affiliate of the Natural History Institute. He's leading and coordinating a special research project we have going on on the biogeography of snakes in the Mogollon Highlands. We're excited about that and expect to have some, some exciting stuff to share uh, in, well, within a year. So Andy also, uh, is the um, co-author and or co-editor of two wonderful books that I know um, many of you are familiar with. One is this great field guide, which he uh, authored with Tom Brennan, uh, published by the Arizona Game and Fish Department. I know that we have a lot of Game and Fish folks here tonight. So thank you for this wonderful book, which I use all the time. And uh, also the, the, um, the subject of our celebration tonight is this incredible new book, um, which I can hardly hold up, <laughs> um, Snakes of Arizona, which is pretty incredible. He's going to be telling us all about it. That's published by EcoPress, and he co-edited the book. He's going to be telling us all about that with Joseph Mitchell and more than 60 contributing authors. And I know we have at least a couple of those with us here tonight. So congratulations to everybody. It's a wonderful book. Um, so uh, just want to give you a preview of what's going to be happening here, how we're going to do this. Um, very shortly, I promise I'll be turning this over to Andy, who will make a few introductory comments and then and then make a and there's going to do a presentation with some slides and so on for probably 20, 25 minutes or so. As I already mentioned, and if some of you have just been um, logging in, the, um, the we, we direct you to the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. If you have questions that you want uh, us to address, I'll be sort of feeding Andy the questions. He won't necessarily be seeing them all himself directly, um, but um, uh, we'll try to, to get to as many of the questions as, as we can. I know there's going to be uh, it's going to be a, a struggle to balance the comprehensiveness of our dealing with questions uh, and sort of general time management to, to so that because we could be here all night sharing wonderful stories about snakes. Um, so um, again, welcome, Andy. Um, great to have you here, and and congratulations. Um, the book is really phenomenal. Um, I, I've been kind of blown away by it, even following for quite a while in process, and and uh, it exceeded all my expectations, which were high. Um, it's a work of of great beauty, and also just great intellectual heft. <laughs> um, and I just think an incredibly important new natural history resource, uh, not just for this state really, but, but for understanding a whole group of organisms. Um, our, uh, our good mutual uh, friend, Harry Green, who wrote the foreword to the book, uh, said that uh, he thought it was you know, now one of the most exceptional resources to the herpetofauna or snake fauna of, of any place, anywhere. So also um, just recently, there was a rave review in the, the kind of ultimate place for a book like this, the Herpetological Review, um, that just uh, was full of superlatives, uh, ending with, with this uh, statement um, that it was a great achievement and a significant contribution to the herpetology and natural history in general, end quote. So, um, Again, Andy, congratulations. Uh, you must be feeling really, really good right now about this. I hope you do, you've deserved it. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to you to tell us a little bit about the genesis of the book and, um, uh, and whatever you wanna tell us. So All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that, that kind introduction, Tom. Um, I'm gonna correct you on one thing. It's been 30 years since I started that PhD at ASU. <laughs> It does fly by, doesn't it? <laughs> um, so, you know, one thing that, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take accolades for this book, but one thing I, I'm going to point out right up front, and, uh, and I'm going to come back to repeatedly throughout this uh, short presentation on the genesis of the book and, and, and the vacuum into which, you know, uh, it appeared, um, is that this is a uh, product of a community of people, um, truly. Um, we have 62 authors in this book, um, 59 species accounts and three introductory chapters. That You might think that that equates to one author for each of those contributions, but that's not the case. Um, many of these accounts have multiple authors. Many of these authors contributed multiple 
chapters and or species accounts throughout the book. So that's a whole lot of uh, expertise. Um, all of those people are experts in one regard or another on the species and the subjects on, on, on which they wrote um, in this book. We have 73 photographers, you know, for 300 and some odd photographs. Um, you know, unpaid photographers, unpaid authors. These people contributed their time to the book. Um, the photographers, you know, are, are untold amounts of money spent on gasoline and trips to go out and find these animals in the wild and spend time with them and, and capture the beautiful photographs that they let us use for the book. Um, two scientific editors, myself and, and Joe Mitchell, um, you know, kind of the ringmasters for the whole project, I, you know, we'll take credit for the, the, the vision and organization um, for sure. We had a copy editor, uh, Julie Hammonds, I'll come back to her later. That was a, a, a critical and important decision that we made early on was to, uh, to edit the scientific editors and, and that's important. A scientific illustrator, Randy Babb, um, renowned throughout the um, Southwest for his illustrations of herps, fish, mammals, everything. Um, and um, we had a fantastic professional layout team that we hired for the book, and that was a critical decision as well. And then multiple funding organizations, which I'll talk about at the end. Um, so, you know, I think the excellence in this book is a reflection, not just on Joe and I who get to put our names on this cover, um, but of this entire enormous team of literally hundreds of people who, uh, who believed in our vision and, um, and believed in it for probably longer than they should have. So with that, um, let me talk a little bit about, uh-oh, how do we make this go? There we go, all right. So with that, let me talk about sort of the, um, the, the, the genesis of the book. Um, when I got to Arizona in 1992, um, there was no resource at all remotely like this um, for our herpetofauna, which is odd. I mean, Arizona is this place renowned for its herpetological diversity, and yet a lot of other states had amphibians and reptiles of, and they had field guides, you know, um, if not definitive, you know, complete treatises on their herpetofauna. And yet Arizona did not. Arizona, when I arrived here in 1992, had a book called Snakes, The Snakes of Arizona, um, which was written by Jack Fowley, uh, a physician, and published in 1965, the year I was born. Um, so I was 27 when I got here to Arizona, and this book was 27 years old by the time I arrived, so it was already pretty outdated. Um, and it, it gets a, a lot of heat um, for some mistakes and stuff in it, but really it was, it was pretty good for its time. Um, you know, all of the snakes were included. Jack had dot distribution maps in there um, and uh, it had pretty good reasonable species accounts. So I've always regarded it as a very useful reference. It was just pretty outdated by the time um, that I arrived here. The only other, you know, we had Stebbins Field Guide, of course, which covered the entire, you know, Western United States, but Arizona centric, the only other book that kind of focused on, on, uh, on reptiles and, and some of our snakes was the Venomous Reptiles of Arizona, an excellent resource that came out in 1986, not too long before I got here. Um, and I ended up like with five copies of this thing on my bookshelf eventually. Um, but those were the only two resources. Um, basically, Venomous Reptiles of Arizona is kind of a field guide level um, book, although the specificity of the range maps, thanks to the people involved, um, Charles Lowe and Cecil Schwalbe and Terry Johnson, um, those maps were excellent. Um, but that was it. And so there was no sort of comprehensive guide to the amphibians and reptiles of Arizona. There was no comprehensive guide to even a significant portion of the herpetofauna, like the snakes, for example, or the lizards or the amphibians. Um, and that was for a reason. <laughs> it's because for a long time, we expected there to be a complete and definitive treatise on the amphibians and reptiles of Arizona. And um, Charles Lowe, those of you familiar with the history of Arizona herpetology know that name well, um, an icon in Arizona herpetology. The, the, the grandfather and godfather of Arizona herpetology is Charles Lowe. And for years and years, he was reportedly working on amphibians and reptiles of Arizona, not a field guide, a complete and definitive treatise. Um, and so, you know, 
everybody else, he was the authority kind of stayed away from that project for a long, long time. At some point after I arrived, um, unfortunately, um, Dr. Lowe's house burned down and supposedly the only copy of the manuscript for amphibians and reptiles of Arizona. Um, but what a lot of people don't know is that Lowe was working on that book with a physician named Fred Shannon, who was ex also extensively published in herpetology and active in herpetology in Arizona. And Shannon died from a Mojave bite years ago, I believe on the east side of Aravipa Creek is where he was envenomated. Um, but after his death, his widow had a copy of the manuscript and she gave it to my PhD co-advisor, Jack Fouquet. And um, not long, I think probably about four or five years after I started Snakes of Arizona, Jack told me about this and gave me the manuscript. So sitting here in my office is Amphibians and Reptiles of Arizona by Lowe and Shannon. Um, apparently Shannon's widow had threatened to sue if it was ever published under certain circumstances. And so that's why it never got published. Um, I don't know all the details of the sort of backstory on that, but the manuscript survives to this day. It just never made it to a, 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 a printer, unfortunately. Um, my intention uh, is to eventually donate this to the University of Arizona archives. Um, I think it's an important historical reference. There's in addition to the manuscript for the, all of the amphibians and reptiles of Arizona, um, there's about five manuscripts in there describing new subspecies of amphibians and reptiles in Arizona that never got published, including four for Grand Canyon. How valid they are, I don't know. I haven't had a chance to evaluate those yet, but those are uh, an important resource as well. And all of this, again, will go to the archives at U of A eventually. Um, you know, thumbing through that thing, it was old enough that it really was not an important resource in putting together Snakes of Arizona. Um, most of the material was dated. Most of the references are, almost all the references are to stuff that's published elsewhere anyway. Um, also the species accounts included information on taxonomy and they included descriptions, detailed descriptions um, and some unique data on descriptions, which again, we did not incorporate in Snakes of Arizona because we didn't have permission. But what was lacking in those species accounts was natural history information, which, you know, natural history is near and dear to my heart. And um, while taxonomy and nomenclature and descriptions and all of that are, are fun for me as well, I love behavior. I want to know what they eat. I want to know who eats them. I want to know what parasites ride on these animals. Um, you know, I want to know when they mate, you know, when they have babies, how many babies they have. I want the natural history information. Where do I find them in the state? What kind of habitats, et cetera. So that information is, is largely missing here. Also the dot distribution maps, which I understand were done, um, are not included in this, in this set of manuscripts that I inherited um, either. So, and that was a, a, a big thing. So no dot distribution maps, at least not in those boxes. So that, that book never came to fruition. And, and while Charles Lowe was alive, um, you know, folks were pretty reticent to take it on. Um, I always had a good working relationship with Dr. Lowe. And um, uh, sh I'll talk a little bit about the, my idea for doing Snakes of Arizona, but certainly that came along um, uh, after it was clear that Dr. Lowe was not gonna complete this, this project. So, I got to Arizona in 1992 um, to start my PhD. And in 1994, Joe Mitchell's Reptiles of Virginia came out and I was blown away by the Reptiles of Virginia. I just thought that it was elegant, it was professional, it was complete. There was amazing information in all the species accounts. I just regarded it as, as sort of the pinnacle of a regional herb guide at that time. Um, and it wasn't a field guide, it was a complete treatise. Um, Shortly after that, in 1996, um, I had started my work with Charlie Painter already down in the um, Animus Mountains in the boot hill of New Mexico. And uh, we were down there one October and in October of 96, I imagine. And uh, Charlie comes rolling into camp in his game and fish truck. And he's got copies of his new book, Amphibians and Reptiles of New Mexico for everybody on the field crew. And honestly, it was at that moment when I saw that book that I thought, I wanna do that for Arizona or something like that for Arizona. Um, we opened that thing up, the detailed information, the dot maps, um, beautiful photographs. It was just a, you know, a complete 
long overdue treatise and, um, and covered the entire herpetofauna amphibians and reptiles in a single book. Um, so that, that was the genesis moment where it was like, you know, I might've thought about something like this prior to that, but in 96 was the moment where I just said, I'm gonna do this eventually. Um, said it to myself, didn't say it to anybody else. I was a young graduate student and it would have been pretty cheeky to voice that out loud, especially in that camp. So a um, number of years later, um, not long after I'd publicly announced that I was gonna actually start working on Snakes of Arizona, which was in around 2001 when I started letting people know I was really gonna do it. Um, in 2002, Lee Grismer's um, uh, Amphibians and Reptiles of Baja California came out. And, and when I looked at that book, I said, this is how you lay out a book. This, this is beautiful. The photographs were amazing. The famous Grismer shots, animals in situ, in landscapes. I said, you know, it, it really set a new bar, um, Grismer's book did. And, um, and so that was an inspiration as well. There were certainly many other herpetological books that inspired me, but these were treatments of a regional fauna. Um, you know, Harry's snakes book, um, Vitt's lizard's book, there's, you know, clovers and rattlesnakes. All of those books are inspirational, but they, they're coming at their subject from a, a different, you know, point of view. These are regional synthetic treatments um, of a herpetofauna or portion of a herpetofauna. And so, you know, these kind of stood out in my mind as where I wanted to go. So again, um, it was about 2001 that I started, you know, kind of cautiously announcing various folks that I intended to write myself, solo authored <laughs> Snakes of Arizona. I had no idea what I was even thinking about. That would have been um, a mistake. And, um, it, it would have been probably good, but it would not have been great. Um, I just, you know, the, the um, depth and breadth would have been lacking um, that we, we have present in, in this book. Um, so word kind of got around um, through herpetological circles that I was doing this. And I, I believe one of the people that heard about this was Dave Hardy, um, who worked with Harry Green quite a bit on, um, on um, black-tailed rattlesnakes down around Portal. And, um, and Hardy mentioned this to Henry Wallace, who's um, uh, the lead for the Wallace Research Foundation um, down in Tucson. And Wallace Research Foundation is kind of an interesting foundation. They uh, it descends from Henry Wallace who made his fortune on hybrid corn in the Midwest where I'm from, Nebraska. Um, but Henry Wallace went on to become a very progressive uh, vice president under FDR. And, um, and when he passed, he set up this foundation, which has splintered several times since then. This particular branch of the foundation, Wallace Research Foundation, Henry Wallace had a strong interest in herpetology. In fact, he worked in, um, as an undergrad in Dr. Lowe's lab down at Tucson for a little while. And I believe there was a falling out involved eventually um, because Dr. Lowe might have sent him on an errand he shouldn't have. That aside, um, Henry had this strong interest and Dave Hardy mentioned to um, Henry that I was interested in doing this book. And it got back to me that I should send a proposal to the Wallace Research Foundation that they'd consider funding the book. And so I contacted um, Henry Wallace, Dr. Henry Wallace, he's an anthropologist. And um, so, um, and, and asked, you know, what's involved in submitting a proposal? Well, Wallace Research Foundation does not, you know, seek, they don't, um, they don't accept proposals, they seek proposals. They find you, you don't find them. And uh, he said, send me a one page proposal. And I did. <laughs> and they funded the book for a very substantial amount of money, which the project wouldn't have come to fruition without that substantial seed money. Um, it funded the construction of the dot distribution maps, which required substantial funding. And I'll talk about that later. Um, it also, along the way, provided a lot of information that ended up being included in amphibians and a field guide to amphibians and reptiles of Arizona, which um, Tom Burnett and I put together um, in the years after that. Um, so um, the Wallace Research Foundation funding directly supported Snakes of Arizona, but so that also helped get um, the field guide out as well. 
Around 2005, I accepted a position as a, a full-time um, residential faculty member at Mesa Community College. And so the amount of time that I had to dedicate to the book um, substantially um, decreased at that time. Um, and it was sometime around 2006. These years are a little plastic, take them with a grain of salt. But sometime around 2006, I decided there's no way I'm gonna do this as a solo authored effort. It's not gonna have the depth that it needs to have in each species account. And so I went to an edited volume uh, approach and reached out to a lot of my colleagues um, and asked them if they'd like to author particular species accounts. And um, many of them jumped right on that, um, thank goodness. Um, around 2000, progress sped up a little bit at that point. Um, but one thing I failed to anticipate was, yeah, the depth of each of these species accounts increased. And so the editorial duties <laughs> ended up being almost as much as authoring an account of less depth. And so it really didn't decrease my workload that much. Um, I'm also at the same time trying to get these dot distribution maps done, um, which was laborious. Um, so things sped up a little bit. We had multiple people working at that time, but they weren't exactly um, moving quickly. Um, and around 2012, my wife, Awana, died. And um, that certainly slowed things down a lot. Um, shortly after that, um, sometime I think in early 2013, I reached out uh, to Joe Mitchell, um, whose book I admired so much on Reptiles of Virginia, one of my inspirations. And I asked Joe if he would consider co-editing Snakes of Arizona with me. Joe got his master's degree here in Arizona. Um, so that was also part of the reason Joe knew Arizona and knew Arizona herpetology. Um, he's an alumnus of uh, Arizona State University. And in fact, had the same advice I did Jack Foquet, who was with at ASU for a very long time. So we shared an advisor and, and, and a connection to Arizona. Joe did not say yes right away. Um, Joe said to send him everything I had, the prospectus, sample accounts, et cetera. Um, and he would make a decision. Joe is, um, has very high standards. And I think he was not gonna get involved unless this was gonna have the potential to meet his standards. And so I sent him that information and almost right away, he agreed to jump on after that. Thank goodness, um, because um, Joe brought a scientific editor's perspective, different overlapping, but different from my own, which I think really, really strengthened our final product. Things still kind of were moving a little slowly in, um, in those um, early years after my wife passed. And um, I think I was probably the main bottleneck um, for the flow of manuscripts and things like that. And so um, sometime around 2015, Joe had some ex parte communications with Tom Jones at Game and & Fish and my good friend, Randy Babb. And, um, and they decided that I needed a kick in the pants and, um, and I got some phone calls that basically said, you've got a lot of folks invested here. You need to get this done. And, um, and, um, and I took that to heart. Um, shortly after that, in 2016, um, Joe and I made the decision to bring Julie Hammonds on as copy editor. Um, Arizona Game and Fish Department generously funded her pay as a copy editor. And um, Joe and I, countless, countless times said to each other, that was one of the smartest things we did in the book, was brought on a copy editor. A scientific editor is not a copy editor. A copy editor sees the world in a different way <laughs> and a printed page in a different way than all of the rest of us do. And um, this book is pretty darn tight. It's certainly not error free. 850 pages is a lot of information and a lot of editing, but it is, pretty damn tight. And most of that is due to Julie Hammonds, who was not just a, uh, an amazingly good editor, scientific editor, copy editor, but also um, just a joy to work with. Um, so things really started moving at that point um, with uh, um, Randy and Tom uh, kind of doing a lot of extra things in the background. Joe and I move in manuscripts quickly, Julie Hammonds. Um, we started putting pressure on some of our more recalcitrant authors <laughs> pretty hard at that point. And so by July of 2019, all the species accounts and all of the contributed chapters were done and laid out. I mean, laid out, done. So they had been through um, 
scientific editing, they'd been through copy editing, they'd been through peer review, they'd been laid out, the authors had gone through their layouts and made their final changes. There's a lot in production. And in early, I think actually in June of 19, I sent that entire PDF of all the laid out contributed chapters in species accounts to Joe and said, this is your last pass, Joe. Um, I had already made mine and Joe started going through the whole thing. I can't remember the exact date in July, but um, literally 24 to 48 hours before Joe died in July of 2019, he, um, he sent me his final edits on the complete manuscript minus the front and back matter laid out. Um, and so we were able to incorporate his final edits. Um, unfortunately, um, the next morning he woke up, took some stuff to the, uh, to landfill and or actually to a recycling center and um, uh, cover and blew off his barbecue grill in the back of his truck. He went back to pick it up out of the highway and was clipped by a semi truck. And, um, and so um, one of my biggest regrets of the book is that um, my good friend Joe and co-editor is never going to hold this in his hands. Um, and, uh, and it really was a, um, a, a great collaboration and, and a vision that that we shared. I mean, it, it, we rarely disagreed on anything. Um, and, um, you know, if one of us came up with an idea that we felt strongly about the other one, usually, so oh, that's a great idea and agreed with it. And um, so um, uh, one of many kind of sad points along the path of the production of this book. Um, after Joe passed, we had to put together the front and back matter. So preface, um, methods and materials, introduction, um, uh, forward, um, literature cited, maps, index, glossary, all that stuff. Um, and we managed to do all of that um, in a year with a, a lot of help um, from other folks, such that in September of 2020, we sent the book to us after 18 years of working on it. There's um, some things I feel like we absolutely did right. Um, there's probably mistakes we made along the way as well, but things I felt like we really did right is um, um, we went with an edited approach and we summoned a community of experts and had them author the accounts. And I think that really increased um, the um, academic authority of the book and, um, and the depth of the accounts. Um, the most complete information you can find for many of these species is going to be summarized in, in Snakes of Arizona. The thing that we did that um, Joe and I concur 100% on is we hired Julie Hammonds, a professional scientific copy editor who it catches grammar things that are so arcane you would never know. You know, Joe and I would send these manuscripts after we'd both add them to Julie and we'd come back and just hang our heads in shame at the we missed. So anybody that's considering an effort like this, hire a scientific copy editor. It, it'll be, you, you will be so happy you did so. Um, we also collaborated with professionals to produce those dot distribution maps. Um, and um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a later slide, but um, certainly don't have the GIS chops to do this in a GIS database, but we did our dot distribution maps in a GIS database. That gave us a lot of flexibility and power we wouldn't have had had we used some old school methods. We hired a professional layout team and, um, and I'm so glad we did. They were a joy to work with, Spiral Graphics. Um, we got peer review and then we got some more peer review and we got more peer review. Every one of these accounts went through peer review, um, either um, anonymous or, or open. And, um, and then the entire book got peer reviewed as well. Um, you know, we had three editors on every account, and um, I think that increased, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a tight book. These chapters are tight, and there will be errors. It's, it's big, but it's about as tight as a book of this size can get, um, and it's because so many eyes looked at this, so many knowledgeable eyes with great expertise. Another thing, 18 years is excessive. I, I, I acknowledge that. However, we put quality above urgency every step of the way. And certainly that doesn't mean that this needed to take 18 years. It could have taken a lot less. We probably could have completed this in five years had we been dedicated and focused and kind of 
had our whole plan laid out from the very beginning, but that's not the way life works. And I think that that's an important point. We live in a, an immediate gratification society today where people, you know, they want everything now. They want it now. They want to be first. They want, you know, and you know what? A book like this, it's not about being first. It's about the lasting legacy of the book and whether or not it's a useful and accurate and complete and thorough resource. And so Joe and I agreed 100% on that, that we were never going to let a sense of urgency compromise quality. And so that's one of the values that I think we really got right along the way. So what's in this book? <laughs> well, first of all, there's a foreword in this book by my good friend, Harry Green, and um, I'm proud to call him a friend, but, um, you know, Harry's an icon in herpetology and um, certainly somebody that I've looked to um, as an icon of herpetology since undergraduate days um, at University of Nebraska. And, um, and so I couldn't be prouder to have um, his very strong and, and complimentary forward in this book. Um, it means an awful lot. Um, he, he makes a lot of great points about the production and genesis of the book in that forward as well. Uh, not far after that forward are some introductory chapters. There's the usual preface, introduction, methods, material sections, but um, also some introductory chapters, biotic communities, um, by Dave Brown, Randy Babb, and Charles Lowe. Um, and this is uh, similar to the um, little biotic communities piece we have in our field guide, um, but much expanded. Um, I think some better photographs. And, um, and these guys are the experts. Um, you know, Dave Brown is the one who came up with this classification system along with Charles Lowe. And uh, Randy Babb knows which herbs you can find in which of these communities better than anybody else in the state. And so um, each one of these, um, uh, little um, presentations of, of a biotic community included description of that community, some interesting facts about the community, and also um, what herpetofauna you can expect to find um, in that community, not just snakes, but the whole herpetofauna. Um, conservation chapter um, by Tom Jones and Matt Good, and um, both of these gentlemen are familiar, um, Tom, really with the entire breadth of conservation problems facing snakes and herpetofauna in general in Arizona. And uh, Matt Good, who's done a lot of focused um, research on conservation issues in Arizona. So these are two uh, eminently qualified people to write, write this chapter. Um, and then finally, a chapter called Borders, Lines, and Limits um, by um, Marty Feldner and myself. And this talks about species of possible occurrence in Arizona, species that occur in Arizona that might lapse into California or into New Mexico. Um, and um, just general um, uh, discussion of sort of the issues of geographic distribution um, and its importance. The species accounts are the heart of this book. They really are. Um, and they're very complete species accounts. Um, we set these up so that uh, every species account opens with a headshot of the snake um, just because I, I don't know, the head of the snakes, the personality of the snake. And I just, a lot of books don't do that. And I just really wanted people to see what this snake looks like up close and personal. Um, other photographs in there will show if there's on a genetic variation, if juveniles look different than adults, we have pictures of both. If there's geographic variation, we show all of the geographic variation and pattern and color and stuff like that. Well, not all of it, but we make an attempt to you know, sort of encapsulate that variation with the photographs that we choose. Um, we also largely chose in situ photographs, animals in the wild, in at least wild habitats. Some of those obviously are posed. Some of them are truly in situ, um, but they allow you to get a feel for where these animals live and the state of Arizona. Um, one of the things I really wanted the book to do is to share not just um, our collective passion for snakes, but our collective passion for um, wild places and the habitats that support these snakes for the conservation of these places, which are, as you can read in um, Jones and Good's chapter, are definitely under threat and disappearing rapidly um, due to a variety of factors. So I'm hoping the photographs do that. Um, each species account has a section on the taxonomic history, only that portion relevant to Arizona or in the Southwest. 
Um, there's a subsection on the etymology of the scientific terms in each taxonomic account. There's nomenclature history and stuff in there as well. Um, the description, um, sort of an overall description of the snake's body type, but specific sections on coloration and pattern. Um, a complete section on scutellation, including summary stats, um, etc. And then a little section on similar species that a novice might confuse with the species um, under consideration. Distribution and abundance section, one of the favorite things in any of these books, everybody wants to read that. Um, we talk about overall distribution, open up with that outside Arizona, and then we narrow down on distribution in Arizona. And then probably everybody's favorite part of this section, subsection in here is questionable localities where we talk about places they've been maybe seen, but there's no voucher, um, places they might occur, um, things like that. And there's a, a lot of fun, fun information in questionable localities, particularly I think the coral snake account, but anyway. Um, and then a short section on status and trends for those uh, species that we have enough information to assess that. There's a section on habitat, uh, diet and foraging biology, um, predators and parasites, behavior, reproduction, and a remark section to put stuff in that doesn't fit in any of those um, pre-assigned categories. Um, so things like chromosome number and stuff like that. So those are the species accounts. Our authors did absolutely phenomenal job on these species accounts and, um, and I'm, I'm quite proud of the work that they did. Another core contribution of the book is, of course, the distribution maps. Everybody's interested in distribution of these animals. Um, I think that for a book of this scope, it is requisite that you do dot distribution maps. Now, this was almost as much work as the species accounts. Not quite, but almost. Um, and we were working on this up until the days before we sent it to press. Um, the dots in this you know, the, first of all, the background of these maps, um, Karen Blevins, who I worked with on this, um, MCC geography professor, um, put all of our data eventually into a, a, a GIS database um, and, um, and developed the background maps, um, you know, um, based on the information that I wanted to, uh, to see on those maps. And, and I'm really, really proud of these. They've been, they've been used a little bit prior to us, but we are the first ones who came up with the idea of layering um, Brown and Lowe's biotic communities over a, um, a digital elevation model that's hill shaded so that you can see both topography and biotic community simultaneously, which really makes a lot of sense of many of these distributions. You look at that with that as the background and it's like, oh, I get it oh, they probably also occur in this mountain range or in this valley, right? They just haven't been documented yet. So I love the background. I love the way you can, you can make your own inferences here and you don't have to follow the inferences of me. I mean, I, we could have just drawn shapes around these dots and said they occur here with a big shaded map. Um, but then you're trusting my expertise, which you, know, you might know more about where these animals live than I do. And the dots allow you to make your own inferences. Um, the other thing is, is that these dots, all of them represent a vouchered specimen or photograph that's in a public institution. And that's important because verifying and repeating is the cornerstone of science. And these maps are going to be used by agencies and land management agencies, et cetera, to make, you know, legal decisions um, when species that are of conservation concern occur on you know, land they're managing, they can go and see the dot there. They know they can go find a, a specimen or a photograph and verify the identity themselves. Um, and so that's critically important. There's a lot of other things out there, iNaturalist, et cetera, Herp Mapper, a lot of these things are out there. They, they're all great, they're all wonderful. They're another wonderful source of information about what you can find where. They're not always verifiable and the information hasn't always been um, quality control checked, right? I think that's the biggest problem with, with uh, iNaturalist is you got animals showing up where people added the animal, right? From their home in Seligman, you know, not from where they actually collected the animal. Um, and we've seen this happen over and over. Um, these dots have all been verified. Um, so part of the money that, that uh, Wallace Foundation provided, I used to visit 
about 12 of these major collections that have Arizona snakes in them, went through every jar, verified every specimen. Um, the rest of these, you know, and, and by the way, this is data from 76 institutional collections, which we had to collate. It came in in card catalogs, in Word files, in Excel spreadsheets. We had to put it into a common Excel database, convert that into a GIS database. We plotted every dot ourselves. We did not use um, information plots from HerpNet or VertNet. Um, they were instrumental in helping us set up our own routines. Uh, we visited them, uh, Carol Spencer at Berkeley, and she helped, she educated us. <laughs> you know, she said, this is how we do it and do what you want to do. And, and we took what we learned from Carol and, and set up our own, um, our own um, uh, geo-referencing protocols. So we plotted every dot and we verified the identity of damn near every one of those dots as the particular snake it's identified as. We corrected a lot of these identifications, a lot of them, garter snakes, Mastocophis, um, uh, Rana in particular, a lot of those got corrected. Um, we couldn't visit every collection, even with a big grant from the Wells Foundation. So a lot of these, you know, we would go through these maps, we would plot the dots. And if the, if the dots were from someplace odd, you know, we'd send and ask for a photograph of the specimen or we'd ask for a colleague to verify it. So anything that was edge of range, anything in a habitat isolate, isolate it's been verified. Um, I, I, these maps are awesome. Uh, great kudos go to um, my collaborators on the chapter that houses these maps. Uh, Kristen Kabat, um, who is now getting her master's degree in Texas, um, but started as an MCC undergrad. Another thing I really want to point out here, and this is important, is that the production of these maps was part of a undergraduate um, geography course. And well, it was an undergraduate geography course um, at MCC. Um, Karen made this into an undergraduate course. We had 12 students that helped with the production of this. Um, and they get a product that's real and in a book and that they can put on their resumes. Um, Kristen was the kind of the lead head honcho of all of those and stuck with the project for years after the course finished, um, went on to ASU and again is now in Texas. All right, this is not a part of the book that most people get very damn excited about, but if you've ever done a book, edited or otherwise, you realize what a monumental task the literature side of it is. And I've got to tell you, you know, for years, Joe Mitchell told me, I'm doing the literature cited. The problem is, you know, all these species accounts, 59 species accounts, the contributed chapters all had their own literature cited. They're all citing a lot of the same literature. So we've got 62 different literature cited that we have to collate with tons of repetition, everything formatted in different ways by different people. We had to collate all of that, get rid of the duplicates, come up with standardized formatting for different reference types. Um, you have to solve the problem of Smith 1970A, Smith 1970B, Smith 1970C. And in the case of some people like Steve Goldberg, Goldberg 1985F, right? And so those gotta be correctly matched back to citations in the body of the book after you've constructed the literature cited. Um, Joe knew this was gonna be monumental. He really loves doing it for some masochistic reason. He wanted to do it. Unfortunately, he passed before that could happen. And um, so at that point, you know, I was lamenting um, the, the job quite a bit and Tom Jones at Game and Fish offered to assist. And so, um, you know, probably about 75% Tom and 25% me, we managed to get this thing um, um, organized. And again, it's pretty tight. And after we went through it, um, Julie Hammonds, our copy editor went through it and for once found relatively few errors. <laughs> I was fairly happy with that. So um, I think it's a pretty tight um, literature site and I'm pretty proud of it. It's 60 some pages of literature citations, 3000 plus citations, it was enormous. But it's an important part of the book because this takes you to the data that supports the statements we make in these species accounts. Things our authors say are supported by this scientific literature. I hope it's become abundantly clear that this book literally took a village. Um, we got funding from Wallace Research Foundation, again, maps, logistics, art, um, you know, trips to museum collections to verify specimens. And then at the, after 17 years of waiting for this book, Henry Wallace voluntarily offered 
a, a print a substantial printing subvention. Um, in other words, he paid for some of the printing costs so that we could lower the price of the book. Normally a book like this would be 150 or $200 of this quality and size. Um, it cost $60 because Henry Wallace donated um, to cover a lot of our printing costs. Arizona Game and Fish Department has been a partner on the book all the way through um, and provided extensive funding um, for copy editing. Almost most of the copy editing was paid for um, by Arizona Game and Fish Department. Um, and most of, or all of the copy editing, I'm sorry, all of the copy editing, most of the layout was paid for by Arizona Game and Fish. Um, US Fish and Wildlife Service, San Bernardino uh, um, National Wildlife Refuge um, also has made donations to the layout of the book. Um, and we had the institutional support from the bio collections at Arizona State University, gave me office space, access to libraries, which was critical. Um, Mesa Community College, tech support, computer support, um, GIS support, International Herpetological Symposium helped us with uh, getting um, the printing subvention from Wallace Research Foundation to our printers. Um, and then Eco Publishing and um, the Chiricahua Desert Museum are publishers. Um, for layout, um, I wanna thank Susan um, Gear and Gary Hill of Spiral, Spiral Graphics, who were an absolute joy to work with and, and completely professional. If you love the layout of this book, that's them. Um, design, my wife, Sonia Sass Holy Cross, was intimately involved in every design decision in this book. Um, it's pretty much her design along with Susan and Gary of Spiral Graphics. I have like maybe two or three ideas that, that uh, made it past their gauntlet. <laughs> um, and then um, photo selection and editing um, was done by myself, my wife, Sonia, and my daughter, Alessandra. Um, and then Susan Gear and Gary Hill, of course, also um, did a lot of the Photoshop work on, on these, uh, on the photographs that you find inside the book. A number of folks um, contributed above and beyond the accounts and chapters that they are listed on. Um, and I, I like to call them unsung editors. And uh, that would include Tom Jones at Game and Fish, who supported this effort in particular in numerous ways, financially and otherwise, um, you know, um, you know, he's been, he's Tom, Randy, all of these folks were just, um, you know, kept my spirits up, kept me believing that we could move this thing forward. Um, but Tom uh, made sure we got the funding to do it. Um, he also, um, as I mentioned, helped with the literature cited. He also did a, uh, complete, uh, peer review of the entire book at the end. Uh, so did Randy, uh, Trevor, Bob, and Jim Rohrbaugh all also did uh, complete peer reviews of the entire book. Um, Randy did the artwork in the book. Um, Trevor Persons uh, endured taking on species accounts at the last minute and churned them out in short order um, when others um, weren't following through. Um, Bob Hansen's been a, an, a resource for literature and, and feedback on countless sections of this book. Um, same for Jim Roraba. Um, last and not least, I would like to thank uh, my publisher, Bob Ashley. Uh, Bob runs um, the Chiricahua Desert Museum in um, Rodeo, New Mexico. If you've never been there, you need to go. It's right next to Portal, Arizona one of the most beautiful biodiverse places in the country. And Bob's really set up a, a beautiful display there. Um, live rattlesnake and other snake displays and lots and lots of cool art and um, all sorts of things, collect collectibles, et cetera, all kinds of historical stuff, um, both Apache stuff and herpetological stuff. Um, this is the most unusual publishing partnership you can imagine in the world. Um, Bob's published a lot of herpetological books through Eco Publishing, and um, he gave us complete and absolute freedom to do whatever we wanted with this book. Um, and you don't get that very often. I started out working with University of California Press. That was not the way they roll. <laughs> I think we have a book that is uh, has the chops of a university press book, um, and we did it with um, a, a local publisher. Um, Bob trusted us. He trusted our, uh, our judgment and our vision. Um, color throughout, no problem. Um, Bob, I need $8,000 for a very professional index. No problem. After maybe a little grimace. Um, 
even the one thing he insisted on, which was no black cover, he eventually backs down on. And um, I just, I can't thank Bob enough. Um, you know, we never, I realized after the book came out, we never signed a contract. We talked about a contract at some point years ago. And then, I don't know, it just became clear that, you know, we had a handshake and that's all that was necessary. And so um, thanks much to Bob, who is not in this to make a profit, but just not to make a loss, as he says. And that's another reason that this book is so cheap and affordable. So this book was all about community. And I think that's where excellence lives. Excellence lives in communities, of people that work well together. And um, we valued our authors. We tried to treat them that way, both Joe and I. Um, we valued the expertise and professionalism of everybody we worked with on this book. Um, and I hope we treated you all that way. Um, and the book's as good as it is because we worked together. This was funded by government. It was funded by the private sector. And it was put together by amateur herpetologists. It's not how they make a living, right? They're not vocational herpetologists. Um, they contributed not just the photographs, but data. I mean, tons of the best data ever on reproduction and, and, and um, you know, predation records and all kinds of cool natural history information. Um, and also, you know, vocational herpetologists as well. And everybody, every one of those segments was critical to the success of this book. So um, um, at, once it came out and I held it in my hands, um, you know, I, I, I was proud, but the thing that really kind of struck me and, you know, affected me the most sort of emotionally was that uh, it was like, um, oh my God, look at all these people in here that I admire. Um, and they, they trusted me to, to be the ringmaster along with Joe and they stuck with us through the whole thing. And, um, and that's really a huge honor. It's a huge honor to have that forward in there. It's a huge honor that all of you invested in, uh, in this community and invested in this project and trusted us. So thank you. With that said, last slide, what's next? <laughs> no rest for the wicked. So a field guide to amphibians and reptiles in Arizona, second edition is first thing on the, uh, on the dance card. Um, uh, Arizona Game of Fish has commissioned this um, second edition. Randy Babb has generously agreed to jump on board as a co-author. And so this second edition is gonna have uh, both Babb, Brennan and myself as authors. Um, we've decided to do some companion volumes for Snakes of Arizona. Amphibians and Turtles of Arizona, an unlikely combination taxonomically, I understand, but it's the right number of species accounts for a book of equivalent size. We're gonna use the same copy editor. We're gonna use the same layout team. We're gonna follow the same editorial conventions. It's gonna have the same layout style, everything. Editors that have already agreed to jump on board for this, Randy Babb, um, Jim Collins, Charles Drost, myself, uh, Christina Jones, Tom Jones, Jeff Lovich, uh, Christina Owens, Jim Rorabaugh and Brian Sullivan. Um, certainly all experts on turtles and, and amphibians in Arizona. Um, and so soon we're gonna go out, um, you know, um, looking for authors for some of these accounts and we're gonna get started in earnest on this um, sometime this spring. Also Lizards of Arizona, um, a short number of folks have agreed to be editors for Lizards of Arizona already, um, but the list is not complete. So I'm gonna just say to be determined for right now, but. I also hope to get that uh, to get that ball rolling as well at some point this spring. Notice that the uh, editor line is a lot longer, and that's by design. We want these to go a little bit quicker, but we've got a method set up. I think they are going to go quicker. More editors um, and uh, spreading the workload out, and uh, for both the accounts and the maps. And I think I think these can proceed a lot faster. So that's the future. And with that, I will. Uh, turn off my slideshow if I can figure out how and take some questions. Well, again, Andy, congratulations. Um, the book is, is incredible. And um, that was an hour, wasn't it? Holy God. <laughs> and um, the, um, uh, it's just a, a, a monument to tenacious long-term commitment. So it's pretty amazing. Um, I, I have a, a, a number of questions, including some that are um, uh, on the screen and some that aren't. Um, so again, if anybody has specific questions for Andy, uh, we can go a little bit longer. Um, 
about specific snake questions uh, and or other questions about the book. Um, one thing um, uh, that um, a few different questions have come out in different ways is how did people get a copy of the book? As I mentioned at the beginning, um, uh, that our co-sponsor for this event, the Peregrine Book Company here in Prescott, it has the books in stock and can ship books. Um, there's also was a question about how people get an autographed copy, which uh, if, if it was uh, not in the pandemic, we would be having this as a live event here with a uh, signing and so on. But um, uh, that's probably hard to do right now. But uh, anything else, um, uh, if, if uh, people can get in touch directly with Peregrine Book Company and they can, um, uh, they can uh, ship it to you. Uh, anything else you wanna say about access to the book, Andy? Um, no, I, I think that, um, yeah, you can definitely, um, I think you can order it online as well, so. Great, so um, um, the, um, uh, there's uh, the, um, uh, a lot of different questions here, but so one that might be a good segue is, is what was your most chaotic field experience while researching for the book? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> um, I don't know. They're, Herp you know, herpetology horror stories. Yeah, herpetology horror stories. You know, I've got a number of them. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it wasn't necessarily research for the book. Um, you know, but doing field research certainly is uh, fraught with um, unexpected events. Um, you know, I, uh, I I broke my leg doing my master's thesis in Nebraska. Um, I was envenomated doing my master's thesis in Nebraska. I was envenomated doing my PhD in, on the Animas Mountains in the Boot Hill in New Mexico. Um, so two envenomations. Um, you know, there's, you know there's, there's, there's a lot of risks out there um, and a, a, a long career in the field and you're gonna, you're gonna have some mishaps along the way. <laughs> um, uh, Probably one that's mentioned in the Mastacophis bilineatus account, thanks, Christina Jones, is uh, that one time we caught this Mastacophis, but we had this Mastacophis bilineatus cornered in this tree. You know, they'll, they'll flee up a tree when you chase them. And, um, and so this, it's a long whip snake, right? And so it's up in the tree and it's on a branch that's a little too high. And so the guys on the other side scare it towards me. And I, I say, I got him. You know, I pull the branch down, you know, so that I can reach up and grab him. And as I pull the branch down, he slides off the branch, falls on my face, no, mouth open, he grabs onto my nostril so that his jaw goes inside my nostril and the top of his head is on the outside of my nose and he is latched on. And, and he, I can't pull him off and you're trying, you can't even get a hold of the bottom jaw to pry him off. And, and then somebody snapped a picture of that and of course, my eyes were watering, so I got told that I was crying. <laughs> There's a little bit of difference. You know, it's because the jaw was in my nose, but yeah, I had a bloody nose from a snake. <laughs> um, I got a number of questions. Um, uh, well, a whole series of questions, but several of them, I know you're a, a rattlesnake expert. And of course, a lot of people have special interest in rattlesnakes. Um, <laughs> And uh, I'll just throw a, a handful of questions out. Um, these are from Lokana, if I am saying your name right. Um, uh, one is, do the pheromones of king snakes discourage rattlesnakes or is it their physical presence? Um, another is, do young rattlesnakes have more potent venom or are they less able to control the amount of venom injected? And so, then, okay, yeah. so first of all, yes, um, rattlesnakes do respond to, um, scent odors from king snakes um, and, 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 and in an adverse way. They also do respond to the physical presence of king snakes doing something called body bridging, which if they're in a burrow or something like that can help keep the, uh, the king snake from ingesting them. The second question had to do with uh, venom. I'm not you know, an expert on venom per se, but um, I think your question was about you know, venom and age in rattlesnakes. And, you know, look, as, a, as the rattlesnakes age, the um, amount of venom that they store in the glands changes. And so that's one factor. Another factor is, is that a lot of rattlesnakes, not all, 
but a lot of rattlesnakes change their diet as they age and the composition, the enzyme composition of the venom changes as they age as well. And so any hard and fast rules about babies or adults being more or less dangerous just are not gonna apply across the board and across rattlesnake species. Cool. Um, maybe one other thing about rattlesnakes before we move on is, um, are some rattlesnake species less tolerant of or more agitated by human presence than others? Well, I would say, yeah, I, you know, uh, th there's certainly variation um, among rattlesnake species, I think, based on my experience in terms of their overall temperament and how rapidly they'll escalate a defensive behavior. So, you know, people always act like this is aggression and it's not aggression, it's defensive behavior. And certainly there are species that are quicker to go into a defensive mode. And there's different levels of that escalation uh, of, that, uh, of that behavior, at which, you know, culminates in striking, right? Um, but there's certain, certainly species that tend to be, you know, I guess we would say more docile. They are, um, they, they tend to rely on crypsis more. They're less likely to start rattling early. Um, but you got to remember that there's also tremendous variation amongst individuals in temperament, just like people. <laughs> and, um, and, that, and that just like people, a lot of that's situational too. You know, so a, a warm versus a cold rattlesnake, a rattlesnake that's exposed versus one that feels a little bit more, you know, safe in a corner of habitat, right? So has a retreat nearby. Um, so yeah, they, they certainly do vary. Yeah, great. Another, another question uh, from somebody else also about rattlesnakes from Carolyn. She asks, what, what do you do when you meet up with a rattlesnake and that she this summer happened upon a Western diamondback and was about 10 feet away, turned and called her dog and ran. She said it was haunched, hissing and rattling. And if, if there's one rattlesnake, is it likely that there's more than one nearby? Well, you know, rattlesnakes are solitary for much of the year, but not all of the year. So there are times of the year where rattlesnakes congregate. Um, if they're communal hibernators, um, you know, that's during ingress and egress in the spring and fall. And, um, and then also, you know, during mating season, you can sometimes have a female with one, two or three males nearby. Um, females um, have rookeries sites that they'll gather together at um, in, in the final stages of gestation before they give birth. So it's not unlikely that if you see one, there's another one nearby. I wouldn't say it's likely either though. Um, and so what she did isn't, you know, the runaway part maybe wasn't the best idea. Um, I think, you know, the best advice is you hear a rattlesnake or you see a rattlesnake, stop, you know, and if you're far enough away that it can't strike you from where it is, go ahead and, you know, look around and make sure that you've got a way to walk away from that rattlesnake calmly or grab your dog or whatever to keep him away and then move out of the area. Um, you know, it's not just other rattlesnakes that are a problem. If you're on a trail and a rattlesnake spooks you and you just take off to run the other direction, you might go over that rock and 20 feet over a ledge, right? And so that, that jerk away response probably isn't necessary unless you're within about three feet. Great. Um, uh, Susan from the Peregrine Book Company um, asked if you have a favorite snake species or two. <laughs> it's like asking if you got a favorite kid. Well, who's your favorite beetle? <laughs> <laughs> Um, gosh, I don't know. I mean, I love them all, <laughs> you know. Um, I, you know, I worked on Desert Massasauga and Ridge Nose Rattlesnakes for my dissertation. And so I, you know, I, I, I have a, a, a fondness for those, of course. Um, and then I also worked on prairie rattlesnakes and I like those. And I, I'm a Grand Canyon freak. So I'm kind of into the Grand Canyon rattlesnake. Um, but you know they they may or may not be amongst the most remarkable snakes in Arizona. Um, I mean, you've got things like hognose snakes that are out there shoveling up dirt and toads, and you've got you know I mean the vine snakes. I mean, just look at their morphology. They're just amazingly graceful, beautiful. Um, I you know so I don't know a favorite. It's so hard. 
but those would be those would be some that come to mind, I guess. But they're all cool. I mean, you pick up a freaking common old gopher snake, and you know, I think people that like snakes are immediately captured by that gopher snake. They're just gorgeous animals. You look at that head close up, the coloration, the the stripe, the speckling, and the that hue, which is I don't know if it's gray or what it is on their heads, but it's just this beautiful color. And so, yeah. That's one of my personal favorites. Yeah. Um, so we're running a little short of time. So maybe we'll just take two or three more questions or comments, but um, a whole bunch of people saying congratulations and thanks for the, for the enlightening presentation. Um, Robert Villa from the, uh, says congratulations from the Tucson Herpetological Society and says they look forward to supporting the rest in the series. Awesome. Um, uh, somebody, um, somebody anonymous <laughs> asked, you just mentioned vine snakes and somebody um, said, uh, where did it go? Somebody said, can you, can you, uh, um, can you verify that vine snakes truly really exist? Which I think you just did. <laughs> <laughs> this um, is person who has gone down to Ruby Road and driven back and forth probably <laughs> two dozen times and is convinced that, that the snipe and the vine snake are the same thing. <laughs> okay. Um, so, and we, uh, we also just heard from uh, someone at the Phoenix Herpetological Society saying they're also uh, really excited and would love to get some books for their gift shop. Um, okay, so lots of, lots of great kudos here. Um, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Um, uh, Kevin Cron asked if rosy boas or coral snakes have more unverified locations or neither. Rosy boa or coral snakes? Boy, uh, more verified localities? Unverified. Unverified. I would guess that there are more unverified, you know, this is hard to say, but just, you know, um, spur of the moment, I guess that rosies are, there's probably less boa, there's more unconfirmed boa sightings out there than there are um, coral snakes. Just because the boa guys are so secretive, a lot of the uh, folks that are into, you know, uh, capturing and raising boas, um, they don't like to give up the places that they find them. And so there's a number of mountain ranges in Arizona where we're all reasonably sure they occur, but nobody's submitted a voucher photograph, right? Back in the day, you know, the reason for this was that, you know, nobody wanted to kill an animal and pickle it and put it in a jar. But you don't have to do that to have a voucher record now. You just have to take a photo and turn it into an institutional collection like ASU or U of A. And so, but there's still that reticence to let it be publicly known that Mountain Range X has a population of boas because those boas vary in the way they look from mountain range to mountain range. And I think what people fear is that you'll then get an onslaught of collectors going out there and collecting these animals that live 30 to 50 years, right? And, um, and taking females out of the wild and stuff like that. So I, I don't blame them. Um, you know, different people have different values on that front. And, but that's why I guess, you know, the, the coral snakes aren't as collected by hobbyists as, as the boas are. So I'm, I'm guessing there's more unvouchered known boa localities out there than there are coral snakes. The coral snake is, is cool because I think there's coral snakes on the Arizona Strip, which would make it the most Northern elapid snake in this hemisphere, and um, and and that's based on a, a, a early 1900s uh, specimen that disappeared from the shelves of Harvard, but was recorded as a microroides as a microris at the time. But uh, the guy that collected it, Ralph Barry Chamberlain, he was an entomologist. He knew his he knew his creepy crawlies, and uh, he was at a BYU professor up at BYU, and uh, we couldn't put the dot on the map because we don't have a specimen, but he says he collected it in uh, um, in a canyon up there off of Grand Wash. So I think they're up there. And there's a lot of fun things like that in those questionable locality sections. Cool. We um, also got a shout out uh, and congrats from the Kansas Herpetological Society. <laughs> so herpetological societies from all over saying, saying hey. Um, we're just about it. KHS was, I grew up in Nebraska and so they were kind of the model for the Nebraska Herb Society. And we were always envious of their diversity south of our Nebraska-Kansas border. <laughs> oh. 
So um, I, we're just about out of time, but I just wanted to follow up on what you were just talking about in terms of the, of the, uh, the you know, uh, perhaps some people not reporting certain things. I think you sort of addressed this in the book about the, the conservation implications and the, and the issues of, you know, putting something like out this, like this out there, it, it sort of opens up some information that may not have been there before, but the idea that the conservation value of the education and so on outweighs that. Is there anything you would want to add to that or? You know, I think, uh, you know, this is a, an issue as old as the hills and it's not just for herpetology and scientific natural history books like this, but, you know, um, it, for people doing canyoneers and, um, you know, doing canyons and, um, you know, all, all of these kind of outdoor activities, you know, you publish a guidebook to, you know, the slot canyons of Grand Canyon, you are going to see use go up. And, um, and so, you know, it, it's, it's a bit of a, a quandary for those of us that publish books like this. I, I came to peace with it early on in that, like I say, I think in the, in the preface or the foreword, I can't remember which, uh, or in the intro or the preface, you know, I, I think that the fact that these dot distribution maps are gonna be used by management agencies and they're gonna help guide conservation decisions, um, you know, with regard to land use and, and other things. I think that that contribution is gonna greatly outweigh damage that's done um, by people that, that use the book, you know, in an unscrupulous way. Um, we try not to give that specific of locality information in the accounts for those species that are imperiled. And the dots, you know, at the scale at which we produce these maps, they're full page, by the way, you know, it dots five miles across. It's not like, you know, we're giving you a GPS coordinate. So, um, you know, I, I think that's an important consideration. And the other thing is, is that, you know, the book gives us a platform as authors of accounts and chapters and editors a platform to advance our ethic, right? And hope that others embrace it. And, 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 and you know, that because they share the, you know, the, the fascination and the passion for these animals, that they'll embrace our, our larger sort of ethics and ethos with regard to, to habitat that supports these animals, to, to nature in general, and to, you know, wild places in general. And so I think that's, you'll see that thread, that ethos run throughout all the chapters and and, and um, species accounts of this book. And I think, I think that's more powerful than, you know, than any of the specific information people might use here. The other thing you've got to realize is that those guys, the, the bad guys, the bad guys are already goddamn good at finding this stuff. They're really good at it. They know, they know how to access scientific literature. So I doubt there's all that much new in here for the bad guys to get into, yeah. so. Well, that's maybe a good spot to stop. And, and I'm following up on that. One of the other, uh, or tied into that, one of the one of the comments here from Woodrow is that this is a the book is a, is a wonderful resource for land managers, just as you were just saying, and resource management. So, um, I think we need to wrap it up there. It's getting late, but the um, thank uh, thank you again, Andy, both for tonight, but also for the last eighteen years <laughs> that you put into creating the book, and. Um, uh, you know, I mentioned at the beginning that the uh, um, the the function or the, the mission of the Natural History Institute is to help people fall in love with the world, and this book is definitely a wonderful resource that helps people fall in love with snakes. Um, it's just you can't browse through the book and not be just overwhelmed and, and just think they're more incredible than you ever realized. So thank you for that. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I apologize for um, a few people that we weren't able to get to questions or comments. Um, it's just a, a balancing with time management. Again, if you uh, would like to follow up with um, uh, learning more about the Natural History Institute, we welcome you. And our website is naturalhistoryinstitute.org. Um, oh, you wait, Tom, I got one more thing to say. Yeah. Happy yeah. birthday, mom. <laughs> right. Um, and um, also, again, the book is uh, um, available through our co-sponsor, the Peregrine Book Company here in Prescott, Arizona. And um, you can, uh, uh, their, their website is peregrinebookcompany.com. And you can get a hold with them directly through that uh, and, and get a copy of the book shipped. 
Um, and so with that, again, thank you everybody for your, for your enthusiasm and, and interest in this, this wonderful uh, book and this wonderful group of organisms. And with that, we will say, uh, oh, and just a reminder uh, that I mentioned at the beginning that by this time tomorrow, uh, this talk will be, will be posted on, our, on the Natural History Institute YouTube channel. Uh, and so if you want to direct other people who were not able to be here tonight to see it, uh, that'll be uh, possible to do within 24 hours. And, um, and again, while you're there, feel free to subscribe to our YouTube page. There's all sorts of great stuff on there. So with that, again, congratulations and thank you, Andy. And thank you, everybody. And we'll, we'll call it a night for right now. Thanks so all much. Right. Thanks so much for hosting this. And thanks again to all the authors and my co-editor, Joe, and, and everybody else that helped put this together.